Please, everybody, <laughs> enough advice. Join me in welcoming George Williams. Well, uh, thank you very much for coming tonight. I should say for the people at the door, there is, there is certainly room at the back if people can't hear there or can't see. Please feel free to make your way through if you uh, want a better spot at the back. Now, I'll start by checking, can people at the back hear me? Am I holding the microphone at the right angle? Hands up. Yep. Okay, good. I'll, uh, I'll endeavour. I'll endeavour to hold it at this angle. Now, this topic, human rights reform under an Abbott government, was chosen for me by the Australia Institute, I suspect because they thought it would go very well with a stiff drink. So I do encourage you to um, get yourself a drink if you need one. In fact, it's a challenging topic, you'd have to say, human rights reform under an Abbott government. And we're dealing here, of course, at a time where unspeakable acts are being done in our name on Manus Island and Nauru, where we're looking at winding back important protections from the Great Barrier Reef. And of course, even for the first time in our history, removing world heritage protection status for forests in Tasmania. So I do want to start by acknowledging those things and also to say that even though tonight I'm being asked to focus on the reform, the positive, and I will do so, uh, don't take for a moment that uh, my own concern with those things is uh, not evident. And certainly, for example, with Manus Island, one of the things I'm involved in at the moment is a looming constitutional challenge to whether it is indeed permissible to remove those people to Manus Island and uh, we'll see whether the High Court has anything to say on that question. But I have been asked to talk about reform, human rights reform in the Abbott government, and uh, yes, Richard has stolen one of my jokes. Uh, on Facebook, one of the people coming tonight suggested this would be a very short talk. Another person suggested this would arguably be the shortest talk in the history of uh, politics in the pub, and look, those comments certainly disappointed me personally. They greatly underestimated my ability to talk for long periods. <laughs> about little of substance and on this, on this I would say I put forward my credentials as having recently published a 400 page book on human rights under the Australian Constitution. Now we don't have a Bill of Rights of any kind yet 400 pages of detailed analysis <laughs> underpin that book. I would say that it makes a wonderful gift if uh, any of you uh, loved ones, Christmas is not that far away. But, uh, <laughs> That's Human Rights Under the Constitution, all good bookstores, Oxford University Press, and uh, I would merely mention that by way of saying don't, don't ever underestimate my ability to talk on any topic, including this one. But I would also say that those comments are exactly what I want to tackle tonight, the notion that when we have conservative governments in this country, that the agenda and the push for human rights necessarily languishes, and indeed we almost should give up on the idea of, of achieving progressive long-term human rights reform. And I'm someone who has fought for many years for legal protection of human rights. And I'd say to you that with a conservative government, the landscape changes. But in fact, there are important opportunities that need to be grasped. And we need to examine and talk about those while at the same time recognising what needs to be opposed. Uh, for me, I look at the potential of the other government as, on human rights as probably being three steps forward, three steps backwards, and maybe one steps forward. And the question is, what will that step forward be? And uh, what perhaps can this government deliver in human rights protection that might be surprising, or perhaps even be something that even a Labor government would be unlikely to achieve? Now, the accepted wisdom, as I've said, is that uh, human rights reform is something that progressive governments do. It's Labor, Greens, and other related parties that really do the hard work in this area. But uh, that I still, uh, itself, I think, is a dangerous and wrong-headed assumption. It's dangerous because, if nothing else, it introduces a, a deep partisan divide about human rights protection. And that partisan divide is itself one of the things that most often gets in the way of actually achieving human rights protection. That is, we need to embrace whatever opportunities there are for bipartisanship to work across party lines. Because what has been the case is that that partisan divide has very often frustrated any ability to actually get things done in this area. It's also true that there are some things that often can only be done uh, in all likelihood by a Conservative government, or even more likely to be achieved under a Conservative government. And I'll go through some examples shortly, but it can be the case that a wet or a truly liberal Attorney General, uh, with the support of an opposition Labor Party, is more likely to bring about certain human rights reforms, particularly constitutional ones, 
than a Labor Party which is bitterly opposed by Liberal opposition and lacks the numbers in the Senate. And it may be that we can't get as much under a coalition government, but sometimes some things can only be achieved under a coalition government, and the, the record bears that out. I also say the record bears out the very mixed nature of all political parties when it comes to human rights reform, and this idea that Labor are the champions of human rights, the Greens are the champions, simply doesn't bear close analysis. When we look even at the great beacons of human rights protection in Australia's history, take the idea of Doc Evatt, who uh, is regarded as one of Australia's greatest ever political champions for human rights. He was a High Court judge, he was the opposition leader of the Labor Party, but his highest point was arguably when he was the President of the General Assembly of the United Nations. At the time, the United Nations delivered the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the most important human rights document in Australia's history. It was H.V. Everett who also fought the ban on the Communist Party that Menzies sought to bring in in 1951, and he did so at great personal cost. It was a very courageous political move. But it was also Doc Everett who, during World War II, um, led and in fact endorsed the internment of enemy aliens and indeed a range of others who arguably should never have been held in detention camps in Australia. It was also Doc Everett who chaired a parliamentary committee for the censorship of certain materials during the war. And indeed, even someone like Doc Everett undoubtedly has a mixed or checkered record, and indeed you won't find any politician who has anything other. There's always, there's always blemishes as well as the high points. And even the Labor Party's record as the champion itself of human rights, of course, belies the fact that the Labor Party has its own very major blemishes. It was the Labor Party under the Keating era that introduced mandatory detention of asylum seekers, and that, of course, was the starting point of what has taken us to this current situation of mandatory detention offshore. It was the Labor Party that for many years propped up the White Australia policy, and uh, indeed their support for that policy for industrial reasons was very, very important to its continuance as part of Australia's political and legal life. Now, I'm, I'm not saying these things in order to denigrate records, but merely to challenge the idea that there are natural champions in this area and that indeed we should wait for certain eras to get things done because that indeed is the reaction that I often get in talking to people that we have an Abbott government so now's not the time to actually fight battles for the improvement of human rights but all we can really do is oppose and uh, that's the best that can be hoped for. The historical record itself also shows that uh, when you look at coalition and conservative governments have had some very surprising successes on progressive human rights reform. Not many people realised the first attempt to bring about a Bill of Rights in Australia was actually at a state level by the country party, Nicklin government, in 1959. And uh, they attempted a Bill of Rights before Labor did. You can also look at the record of governments such as the Menzies government. It introduced voting for Aboriginal people in 1962. And the tail end of that period in 67 led to the referendum that uh, deleted discriminatory references for Aboriginal people. The Fraser government introduced the Australian Human Rights Commission, then in a slightly different form, which is somewhat odd, given we now so often talk about coalition governments repealing that body without remembering they were the ones who actually introduced it. The Fraser government introduced land rights for Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory, freedom of information, and the John Howard government actually introduced the laws against age discrimination, which are today incredibly important in terms of the work of the Australian Human Rights Commission. And indeed, even some of the work of the Gillard and Rudd governments owe themselves to backbench pressure from the coalition members, such as the new scrutiny regime for human rights that we've got for all new parliamentary bills. Um, a regime, I'm not sure it actually does much, it involves a lot of work, but nonetheless it comes from the coalition side. And the independent monitor for the scrutiny of anti-terror laws also comes from the coalition side of government. I think when you put those things together, as I said, the, the question isn't so much what is a coalition government going to do, if anything, but exactly what will it do and what will that one step forward be? And even though there are things that must be opposed, what are the things that can be fought for with some prospects of success? What are the things, battles that actually might be won at the moment, such that at the end of this year there's the potential to look at some successes without thinking that it's simply going to be a wasteland? Given that, uh, I don't now want to focus on the negatives. I've been asked to talk about the reforms, the possibilities, and I think indeed if I was to talk too much about Manus Island, then half an hour just wouldn't be enough, I suspect, to do justice to that topic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus in on three debates 
that will play out across the time of the Abbott government and to ask, well, what might be the potential for progressive, worthwhile human rights reforms in those areas? And the first of those is freedom of speech. And here, our current attorney, George Brandis, has embarked on what is a very surprising journey. He has embraced the idea of being a champion of human rights. He has used that language directly and sought to reframe the debate in a much narrower way, certainly, than I would be happy with. That is a debate about common law freedoms, as he puts it. A set of freedoms, nobody quite knows what they are, common law freedoms, including me, but certainly they include things like freedom of association, freedom of speech, freedom of movement, freedom from arbitrary detention. And uh, he has made it very clear that uh, he will make it his mission to seek to improve the legal protection of these rights. And he's done so, done so through some key announcements. The Australian Law Reform Commission has what arguably will be the worst job given to any public service agency over the life of this government, and that is it must scrutinise every single law that has been passed by the federal parliament for the compliance of every single section of those laws with the undefined common law freedoms <laughs> that the Attorney General wishes to protect. And look, I'm quite excited about that, partly because I'm not doing the job, but also because I can't actually think of a better argument for a Bill of Rights than to actually go through our laws on the books, do an audit, and discover the enormous problems that exist within those laws that very commonly affect the vulnerable and disadvantaged in our country, as well as uh, issues like freedom of speech. So, you know, he actually is opening up a debate about the quality of our laws when it comes to a, a number of those basic human rights. And that's a job that I think was meant to take a year. I'm now here in two years. A decade may not be far off to actually complete that job. But uh, certainly I'll be making a submission that will, in a very fulsome way, point out areas where, let's take the attorney in his word, these are areas that he needs to fix. And we'll have on the public record the state of our laws. The other big announcement, of course, he's made is the appointment of Tim Wilson as the, uh, the self-named Freedom Commissioner of the Australian Human Rights Commission. And here I, I take a somewhat different view to other people. I, I expected that the incoming government would do what the Howard government did, and that is seek to gut the Australian Human Rights Commission and not to make appointments. And indeed, that was typical of the last time in office, that the commission was just driven into irrelevancy because of the failure to even appoint people to posts and also a series of legislative attempts to wind back whatever powers it had to influence debate. Now many people will disagree with Tim, I certainly do on many respects in terms of particularly where he sees issues of freedom of speech intersecting for example with a racial vilification and the like. But nonetheless uh, I would welcome the fact that the attorney is attempting actually to use the commission, has appointed someone who will argue strongly for free speech rights, um, you'll go much further than I would, but nonetheless, there's a champion of the attorneys I'm making in that body. And Tim is going to be very, very hard to ignore for the government, because it means that when he speaks in order to say these things need to be fixed, it's not going to be some left-leaning Labor appointment, but someone of the government's own making, who frankly will have to be listened to, and the media will give much higher levels of attention to. And uh, I think that needs to be taken advantage of in the sense of working with Tim and others to actually identify areas where, according to his own agenda, free speech clearly needs to be improved, and there are many examples of where that is the case. Now, I would say that 18C, which is, you know, a lawyer's debate if there ever is one, this provision which talks about uh, not being able to offend, insult, intimidate, harass, and the like, uh, really, for me, is not what should be the focus of this debate. Um, I think, if anything, that's a debate of the attorney's own making. It's quite useful for them to fight the debate about free speech on the issue of Andrew Bolt. And the more, of course, that he's a martyr and the media will construct him in that way, then the more I think it's harder to actually engage with the real issues of where freedom of speech is problematic within this area. My own view on 18C is, is that I, I've always thought the provision actually did go a little too far. And I think that uh, I've never liked the fact that it went beyond humiliation and intimidation into also prescribing, making illegal, offending or insulting someone through your language. And look, there can be a difference of opinion on these matters, but for me, the right to free speech extends to the ability on occasion to offend or insult, uh, so long as you don't go into the other prohibited areas of intimidation, harassment. And uh, that's an area where perhaps 
if it's paired back to one of the core elements, then certainly I'm someone who would actually see that as being not, not, not a bad thing to occur. I think I'd also say on that provision, it's a good example of where people think the law can deliver much more than it can deliver, that the idea that suing someone for their free speech will do other than create them as a martyr, I think is somewhat naive about the politics in this area, and we should be more realistic about what the law can actually achieve in terms of changing community attitudes on these things. But what I'll be doing when I get to chat to Tim or make submissions for his process is uh, pointing out the areas where his own free speech logic undeniably requires change. And my starting point will be Australia's anti-terror laws. Uh, I can't get any purchase in terms of political will. I'm winding back some of the most egregious laws passed since Federation in terms of affecting basic liberties of Australians. But I can point out plenty of examples of where those laws trench upon Senator Brandis's common law freedoms and Tim's free speech rights. Uh, one example is the law that enables ASIO to detain a person for up to a week, and uh, that person can be forced to answer questions, and if they don't, they're jailed for five years. And this is not for suspects, but for non-suspects. In fact, I can't find any like regime, and we looked, but the closest we could come is Israel. But in talking to people there, they said, well, we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't have our intelligence agency disappear our own citizens who aren't even suspects. So only we've got that. But in addition, what it does is if a journalist wants to report the disappearance of someone and the misuse of power by ASIO, that journalist can be jailed for five years. Now, I can't think of a better example of limiting the sort of media freedoms that the Australian likes to trumpet and that our new Freedom Commissioner wants to protect than an example of an anti-terror law that bans media reporting about potential government abuses of power. Another good example, people don't realise how broadly our censorship regime was increased under these laws. We've got a law that says if you in any way um, advocate terrorism, then that book that does that, that film, that computer game can be banned. But advocating terrorism includes saying anything about terrorism that might in some way lead a person, including a person with a mental impairment, to consider committing a terrorist act. Now, our law defines Nelson Mandela as a terrorist or people in East Timor. So a book, for example, talking about Nelson Mandela's achievements may be a person, according to the law, with a psychosis or something like that, would actually be someone who might take the wrong view and might consider terrorism. Now, that enables the book to be banned. Now, it's ridiculous. No one would want to ban such a book. And in fact, I'm not aware of any other law on our statute book that enables something to be banned according to the reaction, not of a reasonable person, but of someone with a mental impairment, according to the law. And it's just a really odd and unfortunate restriction on freedom of speech that uh, should never have been in the books in the first place. And hopefully what this will do, these examples will open a beachhead, if you like, to a broader discussion about some of the things in this area that actually need to be changed. So for me, if we have a strategic choice between a Human Rights Commission that's gutted, where appointments are not made, or a Human Rights Commission that has an advocate who speaks about free speech in a way that correlates with actually changing some laws that frankly should have been changed a long time ago, then I'd say there's an opportunity here. And uh, you've got to be pragmatic about human rights reform. If you're too idealistic about these things, uh, the short answer in Australian history is you get nothing. But the chance is there now, particularly for some anti-terror laws and a range of other free speech areas like suppression of information, um, even if you want to talk about Assange, WikiLeaks and other things, I and mean, there's another very clear free speech issue, to actually talk about it in language that uh, will make things at least a little uncomfortable for the attorney and the government. The other area that uh, certainly needs to be talked about is the government's agenda about the recognition of Aboriginal peoples under the Constitution. And uh, this is an area of constitutional change which has been with us for years and years and years, and people often say, well, why would you even bother changing this old document that, frankly, doesn't make much difference? It was Lionel Murphy who used to say that he kept the Constitution by his bedside. He never found a better cure for insomnia. And he and indeed, I would challenge you, if you wake up in the middle of the night tonight, you will not get past Section 24 of the document before nodding off again. Um, so what's this document got to do with Aboriginal aspirations for justice, and why is the Coalition championing the issue and the short answer is, is because Aboriginal people, including Noel Pearson, have been very effective in putting it on the agenda. And what they say and is that their lived experience is that the Constitution has had a profound continuing effect upon the problems that beset them. 
And that's essentially for three reasons. Firstly, the Constitution is the source of authority in this nation for who can do what to whom. And there's nothing more fundamental to Aboriginal people than who has the power to do things for them, against them, with or without their consent. Policies such as the stolen generations, uh, stolen wages, laws about marriage, laws that deny voting. All of these things, one way or another, can be traced back to the lack of protections or the permission given in the Constitution for discrimination. And the Constitution today still has a clause in it, Section 25, and uh, that's why I said Section 24. If you get to 25, your interest will be picked up again and you probably won't get to sleep. But uh, <laughs> Section 25 is headed races disqualified from voting. And uh, it's a clause that to this day recognises that any state in Australia can deny a person the vote because of the colour of their skin. We've put in this to recognise that people would be denied the vote as they were in 1901. And uh, indeed, of course, Aboriginal people were denied the vote until 1962, but it's still in the document. We've also got the races power, which is a positive authorisation for laws that treat people differently because of their race. And our first Prime Minister, Edmund Barton, said we needed this races power, in his words, and I quote, to regulate the coloured and inferior races in the Commonwealth. Now, these clauses are both still there, um, and I've argued before, before Aboriginal people in the High Court, and I've had to confront the fact that the High Court interprets our document with reference to these clauses and reference to the founding intentions that ours is a community that can be divided along lines of race. It's not surprising, given that, that in the last couple of decades, the Racial Discrimination Act has twice been suspended to enable laws that discriminate on the basis of race in native title and for the Northern Territory intervention, and it's not surprising that Aboriginal people say that this is not acceptable, that they need a, a legal system that treats them equally and fairly, not one that is based upon the idea that uh, this 19th century concept, that everyone in the community can be divided according to race, and that determines where they can live, uh, their suitability for certain jobs. But uh, as far as I'm aware today, and again I've looked at this, I'm not aware of any other constitution in the world that still contains clauses in it that enable people to be denied the vote because of race and to be denied jobs and occupations and the like. Uh, we're alone. And uh, I'd simply ask you, why didn't we do this decades ago? And uh, you know, Aboriginal people are bringing us back onto it. But they're also saying, secondly, they need the constitution change because they rightly identify the constitution establishes power and legitimacy. It establishes who are the bodies that get to make decisions? Who needs to be consulted? Who has to be listened to? And the Aboriginal peoples who, for whom laws are made aren't legitimate in that sense. They're not mentioned. And here is where the silences in the document can often be the most powerful. Their absence from that structure means that uh, they just don't have the legitimacy within a system that others are granted in other systems. And the third thing the Constitution does is, over the longer period, it helps establish national goals, aspirations, it's very powerful in shaping political and legal behaviour, again, not in the daily media cycle, but across decades. And here, the absence of Aboriginal people from that national set of goals of who we are, where we're heading, is very telling. That uh, they, they simply don't play a role in a constitutional sense. And if you read the document, you get the very clear sense that nothing of worth happened on this continent prior to 1788. It tells our history, but it tells our history in a very incomplete way and also sets up the nation in a way that was founded upon the exclusion of Aboriginal people. A group according to the framers who were a dying race and if you read the 1890s they looked at Tasmania where they thought that a genocide had been committed and they said uh, in a century you wouldn't expect there to be any Aboriginal people in Australia. So given that you have a document that's drafted for that anticipation, for that idea. So Aboriginal people have fought for this for a long time and it's been something that, it's actually been the Conservative parties who have put this on the agenda. It was John Howard in 99 with his attempt to have a preamble to the Constitution that actually was the modern start to this debate. We had the Republic debate, we had John Howard's preamble. The idea of putting mateship into the preamble was never a good idea. It was never a good idea that John Howard drafted himself. But he actually was the first attempt to put words in that honoured Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, their connection to land and the like, and it was his drafting that would have been the first positive recognition in our history. In 2007, John Howard made another speech just before he lost office, and he said that uh, if re-elected, I will put to the Australian people another referendum 
to recognise Indigenous peoples in our constitution, their history as their first inhabitants, their unique heritage of culture and language, and their special place within a reconciled, indivisible nation. And that's John Howard's language on that issue. We've had in the interim a, a Labor government which has had an expert panel which has made some moves in this area, which has made promises to do these things, but ultimately hasn't delivered. And in fact, hasn't even responded in any meaningful way to the government's own expert panel report to explain what they would like to see happen. We now have Tony Abbott, who, to speak frankly on this, has made more statements on this issue of a positive kind about this recognition, about these changes, than Prime Ministers Rudd and Gillard did in their entire term of office. And uh, I think that's in part because it's very clear that the Prime Minister has a strong personal commitment to this issue. It's very clear from his Closing the Gap speech recently and the very generous praise he gave to Paul Keating in that speech that he recognises also that there needs to be a willingness to cross over partisan boundaries. So this issue of Indigenous recognition, this issue of correcting and historical injustice is one of the big issues that may well happen in this term of government. The Abbott government says they'll release their plan at the end of the year. We may have a referendum next year. Uh, if we do, um, it'll be a very difficult fight to win the referendum. But Australia's history shows that it's much easier to win these under conservative governments. Labor has put 25 of the 44 referendums. Of those, 24 have failed. That's a 96% failure rate. The last time they got one up was in 1946. By contrast, the Conservatives, about 40% success rate. And in particular, where the Conservatives have the support of Labor, they have a very good chance of winning. And uh, on this, again, being pragmatic about it, this is something that needs to be done. We need the Abbott government to make a meaningful change, not just symbolism. They need to fix the racist clauses from the time of the White Australia policy. But this is one of these historic opportunities that might be achieved in this term of government, that is something that Aboriginal people have fought for for many, many years, and that people of goodwill on this issue can work, I believe, with the government, even as they oppose them on other issues, in order to actually seek to have this change occur. The third topic that I've been given to talk about is same-sex marriage, and uh, here also we're going to see an issue that will likely, I suspect, live out the full life of the Abbott government, and by that I mean it probably won't occur during the time in which Tony Abbott is actually Prime Minister. But the fact that it's a Conservative government isn't the problem, and you only have to look to New Zealand and the UK, where Conservative leaders in both of those countries have delivered same-sex marriage legislation in recent years. You can look to state premiers like Barry O'Farrell, who's on record as saying he supports the idea of same-sex marriage. The problem here is not that we have Conservative governments, but that we have governments that are so conservative in their leanings that they move beyond, if you like, traditional conceptions of marriage to conceptions that are influenced very directly by more religious, if you like, perspectives that leave no room for this particular debate. But of course the real issue here is will a Prime Minister allow a conscience vote on same-sex marriage? So long as there's a party room binding ballot, there's no chance that this will be passed in the Federal Parliament and marriage equality is very sensible in seeking a a conscience vote, and they'll probably get a conscience vote, I suspect, on the bill that Tanya Pilsic says that she's going to introduce and that probably be debated this year. But in all likelihood, even with that conscience vote, it'll probably fall short by about 15 to 20 votes. And that that will be in part because of Labor members voting against and in part because of very, very conservative Liberal members who will vote against. One of the interesting things is how National Party members vote on this. Um, in the New South Wales Parliament, more National Party members in the Upper House voted to support this than did Liberal members. In fact, in the Upper House of the New South Wales Parliament, just I think it was just over half of their party room voted yes to same-sex marriage. And again, shows some of the surprising combinations in this area that, in my experience, that National Party members tend to be more open about this issue to the idea, in part because they seem to be less influenced by some of the religious undertones that affects more of the Liberal Party members. If, as may well occur, the Federal Parliament votes against same-sex marriage this year, then the ACT has had its go, it's lost in the High Court, but that doesn't completely foreclose the possibility of the ACT or another state having another go. The High Court has struck down the ACT law for same-sex marriage, but the ACT law was not well drafted. It should have been drafted in a way that was more likely to survive constitutional attack, 
They didn't take the advice of people like Brett Walker and, and me as well, who said draft it differently to give yourself the maximum chance in the High Court. And indeed, if a law was better drafted, it could still have a second attempt in the High Court. I think the ACT law makes that undoubtedly more difficult. Brett Walker's advice was that if the ACT law had been drafted differently, it would have survived in the High Court. That was his view. But he also said the way it was drafted made him sure it would not survive. And it just shows that the drafting in these things is all important, that fine differences of legal technique and just how separate it is from the Federal Marriage Act can be decisive in these cases. So my advice and that of Australia's leading barrister, Brett Walker, was that the ACT was always likely to lose, but may well have won if it had amended its act um, to deal with these matters differently. That, though, opens the possibility of that other states or the ACT might have a second attempt. There's actually a bill that's just been introduced into the West Australian Parliament in the form that people are saying has a much better chance of surviving. Now, in that form, uh, if it's passed, which is unlikely in WA, you'd have another high court challenge. As I said, I think the ACT precedent now makes things more difficult. The waters have been muddied. And the High Court, even though it's made it very clear that it's only a case about the ACT law in that form, nonetheless has uh, set down, if you like, a logic that makes it more likely this needs to be done at the federal level. Nonetheless, you'd be, I think, not sensible to put all your eggs in the basket of the federal parliament, because if the bill loses this year, it's important to keep the debate going and important to take what opportunities there are. And so that means that we need to take advantage of that very conservative structure, our federal system, to argue this through whatever parliaments are available. So I'm someone, I suppose, to draw these threads together who unashamedly would like to see better protection for human rights in Australia. I'm also someone who's not prepared to say it's time to give up when we have a conservative government, even a government that is doing things that, in areas that uh, should be bitterly and forcefully opposed. I think that you've got to be very strategic and careful, quite pragmatic in these areas, and I think also to recognise that freedom of speech, and in particular the Aboriginal recognition referendum, there are things that can happen in this term of government that will be positive steps forward for human rights, including for Aboriginal people. And I think advocates in this area need to oppose just as they support, and we shouldn't assume that conservative governments will be wastelands. and. Uh, that even an Abbott government, given some of its agendas, may yet surprise us, perhaps, in terms of what agendas it has for human rights reform. Thank you. Um, um, is this on? Does that work out the back? No? Nope. I'll just, I'll use, I'll use George's and I'll hold it vertically. Um, uh, look, thank you very much, George. Uh, I'll right angles. Uh, <laughs> mic technique. Uh, look, um, I, I'd like to ask you the first question, but please, people, uh, get 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 your questions ready. Uh, we'll try and get through as many as we can. And uh, the easiest way to get through as many questions as we can is if you actually ask questions uh, rather than give speeches. So try, try and work on your question for George. Um, so, but my quick question for George and uh, is simply, well, simply, uh, in terms of coming back to, to human rights, how much effort during a coalition federal government uh, should people put in at the national level, or are are there either alternative or reinforcing uh, sort of campaigns and, and and changes that could be sought at a state level? I mean, can can we walk and chew gum in that state federal space? Uh, and just very quickly, I forgot to say before, I'll, I'll pass around a clipboard. The best way to know about politics in the pub coming up is to tell us your email address. So if you put your email address on the board, I'll float around. Uh, we won't spam you, but we will tell you about upcoming events. So George, state or federal? Okay, thanks Richard. Look, it's gonna be tough in terms of other options at the moment, because the odds are we will have uh, coalition or liberal governments around the country um, after the elections in South Australia and Tasmania, at least in the States, as of course, as opposed to the ACT. And uh, uh, normally you would say that the diversity of governments gives you great opportunities, and that has been the case. I mean, one of the real turning points in the Charter of Rights debate was to recognise that this just doesn't have to be a federal issue. That the ACT could lead the way with its Human Rights Act, which actually has its 10th anniversary on 1 July this year. Victoria followed, and uh, Western Australia was about to follow before the change of government there. 
So for me, human rights reform is looking for the weak points. That is the points at which you can find someone, perhaps a reforming attorney, who might be prepared to take something forward to set a precedent and look to that jurisdiction where there might just be an opportunity to do that. Um, I'd say for many of the progressive changes, apart from the potential of same-sex marriage perhaps, there's not likely to be a lot of good options at the moment bar the ACT. And uh, that perhaps puts a lot of pressure on the ACT assembly to you know, be the sole jurisdiction that might be prepared to take up some things that simply won't be countenanced by a conservative government of, uh, of any stripe. Okay, Odette's got a microphone. I haven't seen any hands yet, but I'm sure some will pop up. Oh, that's down there. Yep. I'll sort it out in a minute, but lucky this is nice and close. Hello. Hello. <laughs> My name's John Lee. I'd like to ask George, uh, first of all, thank you, George, for a ter terrific uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, if you could give us a few comments on how the Charter of Rights has been implemented, how effective it has been in the ACT in Victoria in the 10 years. Look, it's a good question, and it's 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 worked. Both have worked in the ways that I would have hoped, and that is, there's been relatively few court cases, and, and I say relatively few is a good thing because, in my experience, court cases are expensive. Um, they occur when the damage has been done, and uh, they, I mean, you do need test cases on occasion. But if we had an American system where things are driven by the courts, I think that would be very unfortunate in this space. Um, where it's made a difference, uh, particularly in Victoria, which I know much better because I was involved in the Charter there, is it's played a very powerful role in the development of policy and the drafting of legislation. And what it's done is it's a requirement, in fact, in Victoria that every bill that goes to Cabinet must be accompanied by an indication as to its compliance with the Charter, which has a big effect in terms of people drafting bills and also policies that, at the first instance, actually are compliant with the human rights in that instrument. So it's actually loaded up at the policy level to change behaviours before we actually get to the problem that might emerge. That's not to say bills aren't passed that don't have problems. That's certainly the case. The Victorian bill recently that's being passed that enables, um, enables a, a murderer there to be held indefinitely without prospect of parole. It actually names that person, which is a first in Australian history. It's certainly not compliant with the Charter. In fact, they're overriding it in doing it. But where it's really had an effect in Victoria is on things like uh, uh, mental health, disability, where it's led to very significant changes in policy and practice in terms of, for example, the autonomy that people have had with disabilities within care environments, rewriting policies and the like. And in fact, the Human Rights Law Resource Centre there has put out a document with, I think it might even be 100 cases of individual people showing how the Charter had made a difference to their lives by changing the way government had delivered services to them in ways that were more humane, more respectful, and had led them to feeling that their life had been improved as a result. And they're not the sort of things that actually get much attention, but it's what the instrument should do. In the ACT, the most obvious example is the prison, of course, which operates on an entirely different basis to prisons elsewhere, and that's very much driven um, by what the Human Rights Commission has done here in a desire to actually implement policy in a way that's compliant with the human rights framework. There's another question over here, I thought. Yep. You're looking for the other mic? Oh, look, I think we're trying to fix the mic, but if, if people... Yeah, uh, Dirk? It's not working. Someone will have to shout out. I was going to say, yeah. look, if you can ask, and George, if you can just repeat the question. I've got so good hearing. Yeah. Thanks very much for a very interesting presentation. You mentioned Bill of Rights at the national level. Uh, there was that inquiry, and then it was turned down. Can you comment on your views whether we should or shouldn't have a Bill of Rights. Oh, that's a nice Dorothy Dixon. <laughs> should we have a Bill of Rights? Well, yes, we should. But I, I'll say a bit more than that. Look, it, this is an area, again, when you talk about Labour as human rights champions, we were really badly let down by that process. The Rudd government held inquiry over a year, which had over 42,000 Australians involved. About 6,000 of those turned up to public meetings. Uh, it was the largest inquiry of its time. 80-something percent said the change should be made and uh, legislation was being drafted, the work was being done, and uh, the Rudd government dropped its commitment to that Human Rights Act in the same week that it changed its mind on climate change. 
and it became one of those iconic issues that we want to show we're not going to the left, we're going to the right, we want to keep the Christian lobby happy. And uh, so the Human Rights Act got dropped at that point. And the only reason Labor gave publicly was they would not proceed because protecting human rights in this form was divisive. Now, if that's the standard you use, you're not going to get much done in politics if something's divisive. But they couldn't find a better reason. Uh, I'm not talking much about charters at the moment because I think a debate like that needs to cool down for a bit. It's got to go away for a while. But I have no doubt that this period in government will raise a large number of human rights concerns where the logical answer will be let's fix the law through a systematic instrument like a Charter of Rights. So I think the Human Rights Commission, sorry, the, the uh, Law Reform Commission inquiry auditing all our laws again will expose it. And at the right time, um, this can be brought back. I'd also say that uh, one thing I didn't say in my talk is that human rights reform and the Abbott government is the best possible time to influence the opposition about its policies. Too late when it's in government. So now is actually the time to be working on Greens, Labor and other parties to actually say, get your human rights policies in order and in response to things you don't like in the Abbott government. Now is the time to be sharpening up your policies around human rights acts and other things so that we don't attempt to do it when frankly it's too late. That is when they're eventually in office. It's, it's just too late at that point. So the big opportunity is now to shape that type of policy. Yeah. Um, some areas of human rights reform seem to get a lot more attention For instance, uh, while same-sex marriage has a really good normative value, it wouldn't achieve as many rights as something like fixing up same-sex adoption rules would. Um, what areas of attempt of law reform, which are maybe less sexy, do you think could deserve to get more attention, or do you think will be emerging issues that just kind of circuit? George, can you try and respond? Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, uh, there's some areas that get a lot of attention, like same-sex marriage and the like. What are the, some of the human rights law reform areas that perhaps don't get the attention that deserve it? Um, look, I mean, terrorism law is one of them. It used to have attention, but it sort of drifted off the radar because, in my experience, people assume the laws have gone. But it's one of those hard-grinding things that needs to be fixed, in part because if you want to know where Campbell Newman's bikey laws are coming from and control orders, we'll look to our national anti-terror laws. And they are providing a legitimate toolbox as state premiers see it for introducing a range of draconian measures that they never would have contemplated. So if you want to head off things like consorting laws, a range of things that are coming in, you've got to look to the source of some of those and they're the anti-terror laws. But I'd also focus in particularly in areas like aged care, disability, where I think within our community in terms of the day-to-day -day violations of human rights that affect people's quality of life, it is very often in those areas. And we have a legal system that, frankly, often lets down people in those situations quite grossly, enables violations to be made of, in aged care, people's ability to move freely, to exercise autonomy about the most basic functions in their life. And uh, when you look at areas where human rights acts bite, like in Victoria and the UK, it is very often in those areas. Uh, it's in service delivery, but it's, it's the minor things, perhaps, that aren't worthy of media attention, but which are of vital importance to somebody's quality of life, that uh, it would be good to see more attention given to. Excellent. I've got another question for you, George. Um, just on that, I was I thinking... some at the end too, Richard. Oh, that's all right. I'll have another go. Um, <laughs> but glad to hear the mic's working. Uh, in terms of the Queensland bikey laws, I mean, for me, that kind of highlights one of the stranger things about our political debate, because... One of the fringe benefits of my job is I get to debate Tim Wilson and John Roskam and all those IPA types, and they're always very uptight about sort of the oppressive state crushing our liberties, and they're always very uptight about the nanny state regulating our lives, but then you have conservative governments introducing bills, you know, like the Queensland bikey stuff. So how come that how come when conservatives impinge on rights through human rights through things like the bikey legislation or, or terrorism, why isn't that red tape nanny statism? Why isn't that, you know, the oppressive power of the state? How, how do the right, if, they're, if they do even bother, I don't know, how do they get around the fundamental contradiction that sometimes they're really uptight about the role of government in breakfast cereal advertising but they're entirely silent on the role of government in, you know, uh, taking away people's rights. 
Well, I, I think that's a plea for consistency in politics, isn't it, Richard? <laughs> um, and that's probably the best way of answering it in part. Of course it's inconsistent, and uh, of course people play it both ways whenever it suits them, and people will play the nanny state card when they want to oppose something but conveniently forget it uh, when they don't. But And this is why you know I welcome Senator Brandis as buying into the human rights champion area. I'm happy for him to be a champion of human rights. I think it's great. And now let's point out all the areas that he needs to champion human rights, because if he doesn't, he's going to be a hypocrite. And equally with Tim Wilson, and look, Tim is good on this, he, he, he opposes the bikey laws, and I actually think Tim Wilson is likely to be a much more effective opponent of those bikey laws than I would be, and a range of other people, because he will speak powerfully to a group of conservative people who uh, will listen to Tim, but they won't listen to others. And we need champions on both sides of politics, even if we disagree about the nature of human rights. Otherwise, in the end, we just have a conversation to ourselves. And, uh, you know, I think experience shows it doesn't get us very far. Okay, I'm up the back here. The microphone works. Thanks, everyone, for being patient. I've got Phil next to me. He's got a question and a shout-out for all the hard, the hard workers standing up the back. At least you don't have to sit on this chair. But... <laughs> um, uh, on the topic of Aboriginal rights, um, how, like, do you think that we need to enact something similar to New Zealand, which has a number of seats which are, which can only be voted on by Maoris, in order to have, for Aboriginal people to have a sense of representation in this country? You, you, you could have Indigenous representation of that kind like Maoris do in New Zealand. Um, interestingly, we're about to get it in terms of the number of Aboriginal people in our parliament. We've, of course, got Ken White. We've got Nova Peris, and not many people realise that the new Palmer United Party candidate from Tasmania is also Aboriginal. And uh, that will give us three people within the federal parliament. And uh, given we're talking here of uh, you know two and a half percent of the population, it's still low, it's lower, but it's interesting that this will be the, the highest point we've ever got to. I, I, I wouldn't personally, I don't think I'd invest too much in the Indigenous representation. I think because you'd have to undo many of the other features of our federal structure that would make it just so hard. If we had an electorate across the whole country for the Senate, you could do it. But for the reps, it's so difficult because which seat would they represent? And for the Senate, we've only got six seats every time, so you couldn't really give one seat to an Aboriginal person. It's unworkable with our current parliamentary structures, and I think trying to unpin those structures... Whoa. Sorry. <laughs> ..to reform it makes it, makes it too difficult. So, I mean, I don't have a problem with the New Zealand system, but I think it's, again, being pragmatic, it's beyond the realms of possibility here, which means it would be wiser to focus on other things that might be achieved. Uh, I did, you got one lined up? Yes. Uh, Everyone's being pretty shy, but that's probably because I'm going to deafen them. There's one down here. I'm going to run down the front. I can shout. I can shout. Okay. okay. Put, turn the mic off. You... Turn it off. <laughs> yep. Oh, wait. I was wondering if you could comment on the extent that American style human rights discourse, freedom from, freedom to, has perhaps influenced the Liberal Party's attitude towards human rights. I think, I think the question is about how much the American talk about human rights has influenced the Liberal Party's position. I think very greatly in that the legitimate concerns that people would have about an American-style Bill of Rights, and I share those concerns, I wouldn't want the American-style Bill of Rights for us, have led many people to the view that that's the only option. And because all we could possibly contemplate is something like the US Bill of Rights and the idea that uh, you know, we'll be a bare arms and things like that, that, that ultimately means this is a, a dead end. And look, it's, it's a spurious argument. I mean, the US has got the oldest Bill of Rights in the world. It's a couple of hundred years old, and it shows. Um, there are more modern ways of drafting these things, uh, including the United Kingdom, New Zealand. In fact, Australia is now the only Western nation in the world that doesn't have a National Bill of Rights. And I can't think of one nation in the last 20 or 30 years that has even sought to copy the US, because it's just not the model anymore that people see as an appropriate way of dealing with these things. So it's very unfortunate that when we have a debate about this, it's all about, well, we don't want to go down the American path. Well, it's a good idea. It's all about giving judges too much power, which is their American model, but equally about recognising that giving judges some power would actually be a wise issue because sometimes governments do pass laws that trench upon 
the rights of vulnerable people or upon basic democratic standards and sometimes it's good to have an independent person who can actually make a decision in ways that at least take some of the heat out of the political passions of the day. So I wouldn't go the American path, but still, I think there's clearly a role for judges here. Yep, Rod. Thanks, George. Uh, Tim Wilson's the only human rights commissioner I can name, and I've certainly thought more about the Human Rights Commission since his appointment than at any time before <coughs> then. Um, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about who else is on the commission and what else it does. Yeah, the Human Rights Commission is a body that, um, look, it, it suddenly, it occasionally comes to the forefront of public debate. It was the body that spurred the debate about stolen generations with its very important report in revealing the problems there. It's done a lot of work on asylum seekers, particularly children in detention, which played a key role in changing, actually, um, Howard government policy at that point and led to the statement that never again would children be held in detention things change, it seems, or maybe they don't. Um, we've also had important reports that particularly dealing with things like sex discrimination leading to paid parental leave. So it's sporadic, but that's the nature of its work. It's very much focused on anti-discrimination, and so it looks at race, sex, and the like. But what it hasn't tended to do nearly as much of is, if you like, things like freedom of speech, freedom of association. And if you ask what, for example, a commission will do on anti-bikey laws and their invidious effect on freedom of association, well, not much, because that traditionally hasn't been what it does. It's also on occasion been fairly quiet about anti-terror laws. Not so true recently, but it has. And that's another reason why actually having someone who's more focused on things like association and speech is actually useful, because it will take the commission into a range of debates where it traditionally hasn't trodden. It's also true that the position that Tim Wilson has had was actually never filled under Labor. So this role of the Human Rights Commissioner, which is he's doing, which is the broader role for speech and the like, actually was just being chronically underfilled. And the president of the body had to do it because Labor never had someone to fill that position. So, you know, again, I, I'd say, well, I'm glad that the Liberals have finally filled something that hasn't been filled. And I think it'll be very useful for Australians to understand that that body engages with a broader range of freedoms than anti-discrimination, as important as that is. Question on the uh, international ramifications of all of this. Um, I'm just wondering whether we should be worried um, about our international reputation on human rights being um, weakened um, because both of the sort of domestic lack of uh, political will to you know really positively act on human rights, and also when our likely um, leaders under the coalition will be less willing to advocate strongly for the human rights of others, say, um, for, you know, Sri Lanka, oh, the Sri Lankan government? The question's about our international reputation on human rights. Certainly Manus Island isn't going to help, um, <laughs> and neither should it, of course. And but It's interesting when you talk to people internationally. On the one hand, Australia is regarded as one of the very best international citizens. We've signed on to pretty much every human rights treaty you can imagine. And we are seen as a, a really a, a guiding light for the rest of the world and our willingness to sign up to these things. We just don't implement it domestically, but that's a different story. Um, but I think some of the domestic policies are now starting to shape that international reputation, and so they should. But what might happen for that? What price will be paid for that? Well, I don't see much of a political price being paid for that, if any. And uh, I mean, for example, when we had the mandatory sentencing in the Northern Territory, which led to Aboriginal children being sentenced for up to a year for very minor crimes, and we had a suicide, that went to an international body which said that breached Australia's uh, adherence to the International Convention about Racial Discrimination. And that led the Dennis Burke, the then Chief Minister at the time, to say, well, that confirmed he was on the right track if the international body was disagreeing with him. And he said that uh, this is simply designed to cause us embarrassment and uh, you know, as he, as he said at the time, you know, he was just basically prepared to tell him to piss off. Um, soon afterwards, Alexander Downer said that if the international human rights monitors came to Australia, he'd be prepared to give them a bloody nose. So, you know, we've gone through this period before. That plays well in domestic politics. And so I think there is a problem about our international reputation, but it's not one that's likely to retard actions in this area. In fact, it may well actually play the other way. Uh, where's Odette? Uh, 
maybe I'll back, there's a few questions. I was going to say, Colin, I can... Uh -huh. yeah. I'm going to talk softly, just in case. Actually, I have a question from Neil James. Yeah, good day, George. Neil James from the Australia Defence Association. Um, as you know, uh, like you, we oppose the laws about ASIO uh, questioning. Um, but there is another aspect of the uh, counter-terror laws that uh, I'd be interested in your view. Uh, they now rightly close the Birchett loophole and uh, uh, outlaw uh, treacherous assistance to the enemy the Defence Force is fighting. But it has to be a deliberate act. Um, would you support also outlawing reckless acts uh, if there was appropriate protection for legitimate dissent? Uh, look, no, normally it is the case that we've got a provision that outlaws deliberate acts that ought also to uncover reckless acts, and it's pretty standard that that would be the case. And so long as it has the additional protections that normally go with that, like a, a much lower um, sentence involved, then uh, look at first principle, no, I, I wouldn't say I had a problem with that. Um, and I might also say about your support, for example, for removing the, the ASIO laws, that one of the interesting things about recent inquiries, for example, an inquiry COAG, convened that had very senior people from police agencies was they they recommended the repeal of a number of these laws themselves and said actually these are not helpful we don't need them they need to go and yet despite that so we've had no political buy-in so their own agencies are saying this in public reports yet we still can't actually get the traction to remove some aspects of the laws that actually just aren't needed all right Odette I'll let you pick one last person okie doke one more right here Hi there. I'm interested in the prospects of a Bill of Human Rights and whether indeed we also need a Bill of Human Responsibility. The question was, did you hear that? I did. Do we need a Bill of Responsibilities? Now, people might not know that the ACT is the only jurisdiction in the world that has had a draft Bill of Responsibilities introduced. It was actually Bill Stefaniak, who in response to the ACT Human Rights Act introduced a Bill of Responsibilities. And um, look, it's worthwhile looking. It was, it, it was not the best attempt at a Bill of Responsibilities. It had things in it such as your responsibility not to objectify women, not to, on one occasion, not to say things that might offend the broader population. And it was just poorly drafted, I think, as an example. I don't have a problem with using the language of responsibilities. In fact, the Victorian Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities that I helped draft refers to responsibilities very clearly up front. And uh, I think in terms of reframing the debate, responsibilities don't need to be a right-wing thing, but we should talk about our responsibilities even to refugees, to people in need, to people who need government assistance. And if we were to take that debate seriously, then in fact there's a lot we should recognise as our responsibilities that, that we could do more with. I don't think that would amount to a bill of responsibilities because I can't see how you draft it in a meaningful way. But uh, I'm very open to the idea of building that into the conversation about human rights and our responsibilities to others as part of that. Okay, well, uh, look, it's seven o'clock. Uh, the pub is open up here. The, uh, the, the, the bistro is open downstairs. Uh, there's plenty of people in the room here who clearly share your interest in, uh, uh, in human rights. Uh, so please, if you can, stick around. Uh, again, if you want to know about upcoming events, try and sign up for that, uh, uh, that clipboard if it didn't get to you. Uh, but most importantly, can you all please join me in thanking Professor George Lee.